bit of a few minutes late start uh, since it took all of us a little bit to time to get here. Uh, thank you for coming. And this is our last meeting. Once, let me say again to the panel, uh, thank you for enduring very long meetings um, to be here. Yeah, I don't care about the legislators, but right. you know our no. always got the <laughs> our people on the our people. No, I, you know I'm teasing on the other end. I, I think it shows that these are topics that we don't normally talk about, and that people do have a lot to say about them, and they need to be studied. So, with that said, let's get started. Uh, and I will call. We're talking about hepatitis. Uh, Dr. Drinzek, did I say it right, Dr. Drinzek? I think if you'll identify who you're with and. Go from there. And we are sort of going to keep people on a time schedule. And leave time for questions. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, members uh, of the audience, good morning. My name is Dr. Sherry Drenzek. I'm with the Georgia Department of Public Health, and I am the state epidemiologist uh, here in Georgia. And it's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, so in my brief time uh, that I have before you, I'd like to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of viral hepatitis in Georgia and how we actually use this information and data uh, for prevention. Uh, so very, very briefly, for us in public health, our primary mission is really to monitor and protect the health of our communities. And we do this in these two primary ways. We conduct accurate disease surveillance to actually identify health problems, investigate them, and uh, characterize the patterns that we're seeing with these diseases. And then we use that information for concrete action, whether it be directly in public health or with our partner organizations for control, mitigation, uh, or prevention. So if we're thinking about viral hepatitis, and I'd just like to take a brief moment to talk about viral hepatitis surveillance in Georgia. Uh, viral hepatitis is a notifiable condition by law in Georgia, uh, and specifically um, acute hepatitis A infections are considered reportable. Acute and chronic hepatitis B infections are reportable. Um, hepatitis B surface antigen uh, in pregnant women is reportable, and also all past or present hepatitis C infections. Uh, these uh, conditions are reportable to us primarily uh, through our state electronic notifiable disease surveillance system, uh, which is uh, web-based and secure. Uh, we also occasionally receive uh, reports from laboratories and providers by fax. Um, but primarily, our reports uh, are entered into the web and it requires manual entry, either by public health staff, by providers, by hospitals. And then we, at, in public health, both at the state and at the local level, investigate uh, these reported cases as much as we can uh, to elucidate risk factors for how they acquired their infections and establish kind of the patterns that we're seeing in these diseases in Georgia. Unfortunately, over the last decade or so, our hepatitis surveillance data has been rather limited, especially hepatitis C uh, surveillance uh, has been historically quite limited due to the extreme kind of volume of reports that we receive and the limited capacities that existed to investigate all of these and even to enter them in some cases. But uh, we've made a lot of improvements over the last several years, uh, thanks very much uh, in part uh, due to uh, state, uh, state funding that we received uh, recently. And uh, improving viral hepatitis surveillance was very important for us because, number one, uh, we were able to improve our infrastructure at the Department of Public Health Epidemiology. Uh, we received about uh, $235,000 from the state legislature, uh, again, beginning in fiscal year 15 and also in 16, for um, hiring additional surveillance staff and also uh, increasing uh, laboratory testing uh, statewide. We've also been able to improve our data timeliness and completeness to give us a much more accurate picture of what's going on with hepatitis in the state. Uh, we've, we now have uh, the ability to have what is called um, automated electronic laboratory reporting, where the laboratories, in an automated way every single day, all of the hepatitis uh, reports are automatically entered into our surveillance system that we can look at uh, immediately in, in near real time. 
And we've also uh, been able to improve our data quality and data dissemination to make some of these decisions that we need to make about prevention. Uh, we received recent funding from the uh, from AS, though, which is the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, to develop the first ever viral hepatitis epidemiologic profile for Georgia. It is almost uh, finished. Uh, we expect it to be finished uh, uh, within uh, the month. And again, this allowed us to be able to, again, put together and display the patterns of hepatitis, particularly hepatitis C uh, in Georgia, and using not only our reportable data, but other data sources as well that we haven't really had a chance to look at, such as hospital discharge data, Medicaid data, and other data sources that we collect as well. So just to give you a quick visual of the improvements in our surveillance, uh, again, this is really, this graph just shows you with the advent of electronic laboratory reporting, all you need to look at is that blue area. Uh, the number of reports of hepatitis uh, C that we have received has greatly increased since 2013, and the time that it takes for us to actually receive the report has diminished greatly, which is in the orange. So we're very, very grateful, and if you look at this graph, it really allows us to have this much more accurate picture of what's going on with hepatitis hepatitis in Georgia. So what is going on with hepatitis in Georgia? Let me just give you a quick snapshot. That was a bit of a background. I'll give you uh, primarily uh, these snapshots that we're going to talk about. Um, we're, we're going to focus on hepatitis C because hepatitis C, of course, or really is of, of, uh, of very significant um, you know, public health import now. Uh, again, CDC this year has indicated that hepatitis C reports have increased uh, nationwide uh, over the last five years uh, to all-time high levels. Same for us here in Georgia. Uh, we'll talk just very briefly about hepatitis B as well, but we'll focus our snapshots on C. So let's take a quick look at acute hepatitis B epidemiology in Georgia. Uh, and if you look at the map on the left, really, these are the acute or new, uh, new onset hepatitis B infections. Uh, again, uh, in 2016, you see that, again, geographically, most of our acute hepatitis B infections uh, occur in the metro area, metro Atlanta area, that's where the population uh, center is as well. But if you look at the graph on the right, really, the increases that we're seeing in hepatitis B new infections are occurring among the age group of uh, 31 to 40. Um, and again, you see great increases even from 2015 to 2016. Of these new infections, uh, again, not all of them can we ascertain risk factors for how they might have acquired this infection, but of the ones that we are able to investigate and uh, completely ascertain a risk factor, you can see that of these hepatitis B uh, new infections, again, uh, the most common risk factor of 20% of multiple sex partners, and again, about 12 to 13 uh, percent report injection drug use. And so you'll hear this pattern again, over again, uh, when we're talking about hepatitis C, but I wanted to just briefly uh, give you a snapshot of acute hepatitis B infections in Georgia as well. So let's turn our attention to C. Uh, so hepatitis C infections, again, if we take a look at how many were reported to us total in 2016, there were over 14,000 hepatitis C infections reported in Georgia in 2016. This is the highest number that we have ever, have ever noted. And if we look at, again, the epidemiologic patterns for that year and for even the prior few years where we have good data, if we take a look at the map geographically, again, we can see some of the highest rates where the, where the, where the, uh, counties are darkest, in the darkest red, uh, again, uh, and primarily in, in rural areas uh, around the state. But if we really, the tr primary patterns that we're seeing with hepatitis C in Georgia now are the following. First of all, even if you go back to 2012, the majority of what we call chronic hep C infections have occurred among uh, baby boomers that were born between 1945 and 1964. Uh, most of those individuals are male. Um, and if you look at the acute hepatitis C infections in Georgia, the, new in, the newly acquired infections, more than 90% of them uh, have occurred among those born after 1965. But in fact, more than 80% of those occurred among individuals that are under 30 years of age, mostly 18 to 30, and mostly uh, uh, those of white race. 
if we take a look, just a slightly deeper dive into the hepatitis C infections in Georgia from 2012 to 2016, uh, in, uh, among those individuals aged 18 to 30, you can see that we've seen actually more than a 200% increase in the total number of hep C infections reported among those aged 18 to 30. Uh, primarily in these rural areas, and again, if you look at the, 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 uh, the map, uh, again, the darker areas primarily occur, uh, are in rural areas of the state, and often associated with ongoing increases in opioid and heroin uh, use, overuse, and epidemic as well. So uh, if we are able to, again, think about, well, how did these individuals likely acquire their hepatitis C infections? Again, not all of these individuals are interviewed, but of the ones that are able to be contacted, interviewed, and investigated, again, the most common risk factor that is reported is 72% uh, of the, of the uh, hepatitis C cases in individuals 18 to 30 years old in Georgia uh, reported uh, intravenous drug use ever. And again, um, over 60% of them reported it within the last six months. So again, uh, this again uh, leads us to uh, believe that again, the ongoing opioid and heroin ep epidemics are very related to transmission of hepatitis C virus as well. Another risk factor that's of, of import is again, if you look at these young individuals infected with hep C, those of a, uh, between 18 and 30, about half of them actually were females of childbearing age as well. And as such, we've also seen a 60% increase in hepatitis C infection among babies uh, 36 months of age or younger in Georgia, again, uh, from perinatal transmission as well. So if we think about the, the, the kind of the primary epidemiologic patterns that we're seeing with hepatitis C, again, that lead us to some practical prevention measures. Again, we're seeing, uh, you know, young individuals, rural areas, and again, uh, individuals of childbearing age uh, resulting in perinatal transmission of hepatitis C as well. Uh, one of the uh, areas that uh, we have uh, undertaken uh, with, again, state funding assistance over the last couple of years is to uh, develop a project uh, with community-based uh, organizations and health department clinics to conduct rapid hepatitis C screening testing in areas of the state. We started in the, if you look at the map, these are the areas in which we have this rapid hepatitis C testing initiative. This is a rapid test finger, uh, finger stick that the, the results are available in within 20 minutes. Most of them are in North Georgia. Uh, again, including the four counties that CDC has designated as part of the vulnerability index, uh, which uh, they de deemed these counties may be at risk for rapid spread of, of either HIV or uh, H, uh, hepatitis C virus as well uh, as a result of the Indiana outbreak uh, a few years ago. So if you look at the, these areas where the, this testing is done, uh, again, this is screening, and so again, it's uh, it, it again is not primarily for surveillance, but it is linked to surveillance. But it's primarily to link these individuals to to care. So those individuals that test positive or reactive on a screening test are referred to care uh, for a PCR confirmatory test, or some of our health departments can actually do the confirmatory test as well. So if you just look at the ones that screen positive, again, we're seeing the same population, young white males primarily, and again, of the ones that, uh, of the 3,000 or so folks that, that we screened uh, in the last two years, 185 of them uh, were uh, tested positive, and of those, uh, again, about 60% reported injection drug use as well. And if you look one step deeper into that, uh, the information that we collect upon screening also asks them uh, what uh, was the age of initiation of IDU or injection drug use. And again, so it's a small, you know, a relatively small number of folks, but again, uh, most of them, uh, you know, again, about 35% of them uh, reported it uh, to initiate their injection drug use between the ages of 19 to 24 and uh, over 20% uh, between the ages of 13 and 18 as well. 
So all of, of this information really guides our decision making about prevention and about practical prevention. So knowing that in, injection drug use is a primary risk factor, you know, it helps us target our, our prevention efforts, whether again, they, which are community-wide, not only public health-based, and also have implications for the transmission of other diseases that share these risk factors as well, such as hepatitis B and HIV as well. So in, in, in summary, uh, really all of this information, and, I, and again, it's distilled down into snapshots, I realize we, I'll be very happy to share our, our completed epidemiologic profile, which is in much greater detail with you as soon as it's finished. But no matter what, really the success of whatever disease prevention uh, or containment strategy we're trying to build as a state and, as, and in our communities must be founded upon surveillance and epidemiology to give us that accurate picture uh, of, uh, of the patterns that we see so that we can make uh, scientifically sound decisions for prevention. And I would like to thank you for your very kind attention. I, I thank you very much. I think we probably have questions and um, I'll start it off. Um, okay. When you say that we are trying to get identification early, which is certainly good, and then you refer people to treatment, what is the treatment? And go ahead. Uh, so again, uh, for us, many of the this testing initiative is a partnership with with uh, uh, community-based organizations and also health departments as well. So so some of this again is uh, takes place outside of public health. Right. So again, so individuals are referred either to their you know sort of either if they have primary care or however the usual protocol in these community-based organizations are to try to get them linked to care. And at this point in time, at least in our, our piece, I don't have the data as to exactly how many of them are linked to care, but we want to explore that. We want to be able to start working towards getting that data as well. So for example, one of the community-based organizations, you know, they may have their own, um, uh, again, their usual protocols for how they refer people into getting, getting care or services. Well, what I'm getting at, and I, and I may be behind and there may be something new that I don't know about, but I thought that the only treatment was extremely expensive. I mean, in the 17 to $20,000 range, Yes, um, hepatitis C treatment is indeed very expensive, and I guess it, it depends very much on the timing and the individual cases. But but yes, there there are effective treatments for hepatitis C, and my understanding is as well that they they definitely uh, are expensive in some ways. And I'm not an expert in hepatitis C treatment. There may be others here that may be able to speak to that better than I can. I I apologize. Anybody want to pop up and add to it? No. Okay. I mean, because when we say we're referring to treatment, it would seem like for many people and drug users and all, that would be an extremely a big, huge barrier. Right. Well, I, you know, I guess I think it, it, it's most appropriate to say that they're referred for the services that are appropriate to their case. And again, maybe not all of them uh, are actually treated. Okay, but if they're not treated, is this not a highly communicable disease? Obviously, certainly. And we would we would so want so they would continue if they continued in their practices <coughs> to either spread. We that would want yes, or to have the damage physiologically that goes along. Ideally, with these infections should indeed you know again uh, be able uh, so that we can uh, you know not only educate them about about transmission and and how to reduce the risk of transmission. But if treatment is the way to reduce transmission, ideally, certainly, uh, we would want them to be treated. I mean, is, do you know anything in the difference of treatments of the babies that have it? Is the difference in their treatment? No, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't. We'll, we'll need to, to uh, get someone who is, is versed in hepatitis okay, C treatment. Okay, thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the yeah. spot. Okay, Dr. Price. Great, thank you very much. Uh, referring to um, the snapshots of, of the um, maps of Georgia, mm -hmm. I, I noticed that it's reported you know, per 100,000, or at least the hepatitis C is. Yes. And both. Yes, they both should be, yes. Oh, they both mm -hmm. are? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
many of those counties, I wonder if they even have 100,000 people. So I wonder why these aren't reported just in gross numbers. Yeah, actually most of the time epidemiologically we do report uh, disease uh, numbers as rates because that actually um, balances it out. It actually does exactly what you said. Uh, if we just, if, if, if we really just, it, it balances out so that again, differences in population are taken in, into account and you can actually compare. So that's why the rates are, are, are uh, projected that way. That's a standard way to do it for most diseases per 100,000. Right, so, so in 2016, just, just as a ballpark number, how many reported cases, reported new cases were there in Georgia in 2016? The uh, new cases of hepatitis C, mm -hmm. uh, acute, not the chronic. So there were 14,000 total uh, that were reported in 14,026 were the total number of hepatitis C cases reported in Georgia in 2016. And I'm happy to get you some more individual, you know, kind of count number data or additional d detailed data uh, uh, if you're interested. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, now, so of those acute cases, and if, and if they're so adequately treated, do they go on, are we preventing the going on to chronic condition? So again, uh, in, this, in this, as far as public health data are concerned, uh, as far as our data, um, again, uh, we actually do not have, I do not have uh, access to data that shows, you know, exactly what treatment was received. So, so there may be ways that, even though I don't have it in the Department of Public Health, that other organizations that, that uh, you know, again, that we can try to link these data almost to, to do almost like a care cascade or to link data to see uh, in, in a more longitudinal way uh, what uh, these outcomes were. And when one does acute become chronic? Well, it, it varies. Not all do. You know, certainly not all acute cases of hepatitis C, you know, become chronic infections. Just by definition, not regardless right. of treatment? Right. 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 Uh, yes, yeah, so I was just curious about the baby boomer populations. Is, is there something specific about them or just that they've been around longer or? So or uh, it is thought that, again, uh, their risk factor primarily was blood transfusions, uh, prior to the advent of, of blood products being routinely tested for hepatitis C. Okay. All right. Thank you. Got Dr. Wall? Yes. Thank you. And, and Dr. Drenzik, yeah, I, I had a question um, about, about the surveillance uh, database. Mm -hmm. um, if you could kind of speak to, to maybe the strengths and weaknesses, may, maybe the, yeah. the current role and capabilities of that database uh, with respect to uh, the health information exchange uh, in our state. Yes, um, so the database that I talked about uh, where the hepatitis C data are housed and reported into, that is the database that houses all of our notifiable disease data. So all diseases that are reportable in Georgia, there are more than 70, are housed in this web-based system. And uh, again, uh, we recently, as I had mentioned, have the, in, in many conditions, have the advent of this uh, electronic laboratory reporting, both from our public health laboratory and from commercial laboratories. But again, uh, m many of our folks who work, uh, again, in the Department of Public Health on our SEND system have uh, been uh, closely connected with the Georgia Health Information Network. And we actually, uh, although some of this is in its infancy, we at the Department of Public Health actually are considered to be uh, a user of the, of the GHIN. And we, again, um, have, have uh, the ability to, to access. And in, in the future, uh, again, uh, it is clear that, that we will uh, be using the GHEN as another data source uh, and a richer data source to get a bigger picture of not only notifiable disease data, but uh, uh, other conditions as well. So we're looking very forward to uh, being able to continue to make those links uh, to the Georgia Health Information Network. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, besides just collecting data, I mean, if you were to make a recommendation of how, I mean, 14,000 cases new in one year is a pretty staggering amount of cases. And if I'm not incorrect, even if we treat it, if they go back to the leading cause, which is intravenous, intravenous drug use, they can reinfect again quite easily. Is that correct? Yes. Right. So it's not 
like something if they're treated, then it, they're not cured for. Sometimes there are they can clear completely and be cured. But are they immune to going no, forward? No, That's what no, I thought. No. They no. can get another strain if they have the same risky behaviors. Okay, mm -hmm. which with drug users would be mm -hmm. very likely. Mm -hmm. What would be the one top one or two recommendations you would make that we could do to curtail these these infections? So again, m much m much of this may be beyond me to r to uh, make this recommendation. Uh, again, I've not. I think that certainly there are um, there there if there are ways to uh, educate individuals about how to reduce their risk of acquiring hepatitis C infections, hepatitis B infections, and HIV infections by intravenous drug use. That would be uh, uh, the the uh, that would be the way to go. That's the point. That's the, the again the point that we see that targets this intervention. So, reducing risk of uh, from f that makes sense to me. Okay, David Bain, quit hiding over there behind a column. <laughs> See, did he get up and leave? Did he step out? Somebody go get him, Jocelyn, please. Um, okay, what I was okay, uh, Representative Price, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question. You referenced IDU, and in, in some places it says injection, some places it says intravenous. Yes. Is is same, there same. a difference? Okay. No. Okay. Really, what I was trying to get at, and see if you, without being prompted, would add: Do you have any information on needle exchanges and I its effect on reducing? I do not. But there may certainly be others here that do it in, in other areas, but not, I do not in epidemiology at, at the Department of Public Health. I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. I didn't mean to put you on the, put you on the spot. Uh, thank you very much. We'll see if David, now that he's been promoted over at Public Health, can enlighten us on maybe any <laughs> going further uh, information about that. Does committee have any other questions? I, well, okay, Doc, Representative Price. Uh, thank you. Uh, injection of insulin, are those needles implicated in any transmission of diseases? No, not at least not to my knowledge. I can I can do some additional research, but you know it's not something that again that we that we have seen. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just you know sub Q. Oh okay. All right. I just missed that. Mm -hmm. No more hiding behind columns. I understand <laughs> that you got a great big promotion over at the Public Health Department. I don't know about great or big. <laughs> okay. Well, what is your new title, David? Uh, I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff. Okay. Well, we're asking, since we have such a huge epidemic of hepatitis C, we were wondering what the department was going to recommend or had any recommendations, one or two, that might decrease this or something that we could do or maybe something the legislature needed to do to change? Yes. Uh, I'm sure Sherry's probably mentioned um, that the surveillance piece was clear right. clearly helpful for us. And education. And education. Um, I know that nationally one of the things that's being looked at um, is um, syringe exchange programs. Okay, that's where we go. All right, what what's the research showing or? Um, I, I am not expert in this. I'd say that the limited research that I have done has shown success. Um, I know that in Indiana is probably the most famous example now, and there was an HIV epidemic, but also Hep C, where the then Governor Mike Pence ended up signing into law um, authorization for these programs to limit the spread of those diseases, uh, and it was successful in Indiana. So we do know that that's, that's a case example we can look at right now. Okay, could, I mean, uh, we go back in session the second week in January, could you have somebody that does know all about this from public health to be prepared to give us a presentation at the start for the sure. health and oh human yeah. services? I mean, because I think one of the things that, I mean, there's been some pushback as the legislation legislature looked at things. Um, if you've been to Europe, if you've been to Copenhagen, and you see the needle exchanges, you look across at the park, yep. and the druggies are all passed out in the park, and there, therefore there's a lot of resistance about, well, you're just adding on 
to their addiction problem and their use of sure, I injectable. See. I can see that. I know that there are programs, though, that have much more of a professional or clinical way of doing this, and their goal is ultimately to link people back to care and recovery and not just sort of enabling continued behavior. So, yes, I'm happy to, to find folks who can give you a lot more data than I can about how successful these programs have been. Okay, and I guess the other thing would be I'd like to, if somebody has the information that time, some new preliminary studies are coming out on states that have gone to requiring that physicians, everybody, check the PDMP. Yes. And I think there's some early studies showing that the states that have done that, some of them, that what happens is that the drug people and the ones that drug shopped just quit drug shopping from the physicians and go straight to heroin. And there's been an increase in heroin deaths. So I think we need to put that on our radar front yeah, as we go forward. Yeah, it's something we look at. There's a, an yeah. ongoing discussion in the public health world about what's the cause, is it causing an increase? Is it just, is it just a coincidence? Um, either way, we know that in Georgia, those the numbers for heroin have been increasing. Right, but this is um, with especially is checking the, you know, since we're going to all the physicians having to check it. The other thing I would wonder if there's a correlation between if we get too strict on the number of pills that can be ordered for patients. I mean, if you go to where they're only going to give you seven, and I'm a druggie, and I, you know, I have to doctor shop to get seven pills, I'm not sure that I would think that was worth the effort to go to cheap heroin you know, it was worth it if you could get 60 pills or 30 pills. I don't know that also the, I mean, terribly limiting the number might not be pushing, might not do the same thing and push people of going to straight, cheap heroin on, on the thing. No, I think it's, might it's a see good question. I know nationally one of the things that they're looking at is can we give um, prescribers tools to sort of recognize any warning signs of patients and if there's ways to, you know, pursue um, paths for behavioral health for those folks uh, and maybe there's better links for recovery. So right. that's, it's a discussion point that's worth having is if you reduce this number of pills available, what happens to that person? Um, we're still wrestling with that honestly too and working with our partners in behavioral health to figure out how to make those links. Okay, I think it's something we definitely need to Agreed. to keep an eye on as we, I mean, there's unintended consequences that occur when you're trying to do the right thing and cut down on one end, and it, it's like that bucket. You, you know, you plug up the hole in this bucket, and then it just pops out over here. So uh, I think yeah. we need to really keep a close eye to try to hit a happy medium of where we stop the new cases and, you know, do things to identify and look that way, but also maybe not, you know, get so strict that we send everybody straight to IV and uh, yeah, heroin. Agreed. I don't know. It's a really complex problem. Thank you very much yeah, and congratulations on your uh, promotion and thank you, doctor, for coming and presenting for us. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on, uh, we have harm reduction and substance use issues. Uh, Mr. Raymond, did we hit on some of your areas? I'm sorry, we just go give us more then, sorry. Not at all, D I don't worry, I don't feel preempted at all. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members, uh, and thank you for having me, I'm honored to be here. Uh, my name is Daniel Raymond, and I'm with the Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, I'm based in New York, but we do work nationally, um, and so we've been paying close attention to how these issues have been playing out across this region and in many other parts of the country. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of harm reduction programs, including syringe exchange, in tackling ah, some good. of these health issues. That is not what I wanted that to do. Sorry. Um, Uh, so I've been working in harm reduction and syringe exchange for about a uh, little over 20 years. I started working in syringe exchange programs in New York City back in the early 90s at the height of our HIV epidemic when 
this was before we had good treatments, and so there was a common sense that HIV was, in practical terms, a death sentence. <coughs> and we had probably the largest population of people injecting drugs in the country at that time, at least 100,000, probably 200,000 people just in New York City. And at that rate, uh, it was estimated that over 50% of them had already acquired HIV. And so there was a sense of urgency around finding ways to prevent further transmission among this population, among their loved ones, and among the communities. So Harmony Action Coalition was founded out of that moment as a sort of umbrella group for the kinds of harm reduction and syringe exchange programs that were popping up in different parts of the country that were hard hit by the HIV epidemic among people who inject drugs. Uh, we focus on health consequences, uh, which can include addiction itself, but also things like overdose, hepatitis C, and we advocate for a broad set of strategies, um, and then we do training and capacity building. So we've been working in a number of states. Just this year I've done work in Florida, West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, Indiana, some of the states that have for the heaviest brunt of the overdose crisis, and in their wake are seeing some of these secondary <coughs> consequences like hepatitis C, like perinatal transmission, like neonatal abstinence syndrome. And a number of these, these communities are taking up harm reduction strategies as part of a comprehensive picture. As they're working on the prevention side, as they're working on the treatment and recovery side, <laughs> they're recognizing that this is a crucial ingredient to make all these pieces connect to each other Together. and help move people through that system. So we start off when we talk about harm reduction, it's, it's not a question of accepting or enabling drug use. It's recognizing that there's a broad set of harms and a broader range of strategies that need to be incorporated to address these at every level and at every point in somebody's movement towards recovery. Uh, we really do focus on evidence-based interventions um, and the negative consequences. So syringe access or syringe exchange programs Naloxone, which I, many of you are probably familiar with the overdose reversal antidote. Sure. Motivational interviewing as a strategy to help people increase their readiness for entering into treatment and health care. Um, but other things like outreach, education, medication-assisted treatment. We, in, when we talk about opioids and heroin, we talk <laughs> about effective use of medications to treat the addiction like buprenorphine, like Vivitrol, like methadone. Yeah. Um, and finally, strategies to effectively house people, um, including a model called Housing First, which puts people in housing as they're working on their substance use issues, instead of saying, until you've resolved your substance use issues, we're not going to find housing for you. Um, so SSP here, I'm using the language that CDC uses for syringe services programs. We often focus on the first word, the syringe side, but a lot actually happens at these programs. Um, when I started out, this I mentioned I started out in New York, I thought we were doing HIV prevention. I thought that we were, we were providing people with supplies that they needed to keep themselves and their loved ones safe and healthy. And that was certainly part of it. But I quickly learned that what people really came for, along with tools to protect themselves, was that human connection. They wanted somebody to talk to. They wanted somebody to ask questions. They wanted somebody who might have options for getting them different kinds of help. And it was really striking that, that sometimes when we, I think we do a disservice, when we talk about our programs and we focus on the syringe piece, it almost makes it seem like it's a drive-through window or, right. or something like that. But what this really is, is a way of bringing people in from the cold. It's an outreach and engagement strategy that works to build rapport with people who might feel hopeless, people who might have backgrounds of serious trauma, people who might have internalized a lot of shame because they've been rejected by their families, um, they've had a hard time keeping stable education or employment or housing, and that you give those, those people a space to come without judgment, without stigma, and you meet them around disease prevention, but what they really want to talk about is what their goals that they've struggled with and have felt have been thwarted. So we talk about, on this slide, a lot of the health components of this, including testing for hepatitis C, including vaccination for hepatitis B, including linkage to HIV mm -hmm. care. 
But it's that human dimension that, in my experience, ends up being the most powerful motivator for change and transformation. Um, a big component of that is that a lot of the people who come to these programs, it's not an alternative for them to stopping using. It's something that they're doing because they've struggled to stop using. Uh, a, it feels very common in, in certain exchange programs that the people that you see have tried detox, have tried rehab, have tried these programs more than once often. And we know just like anything else, just like diabetes, just like, uh, just like heart disease, that there is no magic bullet treatment. Treatment can be effective, but that doesn't mean it works the first time 100% of the time for everybody. That some people need a few shots at it, some people need to try different programs and find the one that works best for them. But in the meantime, they're at imminent risk of harm, of overdose, of, of disease acquisition, and that's where harm reduction comes in. <coughs> we also recognize that there are a lot of costs borne. Uh, Madam Chair, you referred to this, I believe, in terms of the cost of hepatitis C treatment earlier. We know that for HIV infection, the lifetime uh, cost of medical care runs to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hepatitis C, it can exceed $100,000 if left untreated. And the the latest treatment that was approved by FDA uh, costs roughly $26,000. And for most people getting treated for hepatitis C right now, it's uh, 8 to 12 weeks of treatment, probably 95% or better chance of a cure. So it's in some ways it's good value for the money when we think of the costs um, born with cancer, which hepatitis C can also cause in the liver. On the other hand, it makes for difficult decisions for the healthcare system, for Medicaid, for uh, places like prisons that have high populations of people with hepatitis C. So that the money that we can invest on the front end in prevention to make sure that fewer people get these infections saves a lot of costs down the road. Um, we also see similar costs borne around overdose. And surgical exchange and harm reduction programs have been on the front lines of overdose prevention, training and educating people about overdose risks, signs and symptoms, how to use naloxone, and we've seen a number of lives saved because these programs are actually successful at reaching people who otherwise might not be reached, reaching people who are at the highest risk of overdose and giving them the tools to protect themselves as they're trying to find their way back to health and recovery. Now, I mentioned earlier that we sometimes put a lot of emphasis on the syringes, and the syringes are a powerful engagement tool. Um, if, if you're hungry, then the first thing that you need before you want to talk about what's going Anything on in your is life food. is food. If you're struggling with drugs, you know that you're going to be using syringes every day, and that's a material concrete need that we can provide you with. Now, a lot of our programs do other things, uh, warm coats or, or uh, clean socks or uh, water or food pantry, but this is almost a symbol of saying, we're going to meet you where you're, where you're at right now. We're not judging you for using syringes. We're showing that it's safe for you to tell us what's going on with yourself and with your drug use. And then once we've broken the ice there, once we've established that rapport, we can have a whole another set of conversations about your experience with drug treatment and what your goals are and how we can match you to a program that works for you. We can pair you with a case manager or a counselor or a recovery coach. We can offer you information about accessing healthcare services for things like hepatitis C or other health consequences. But it becomes that engagement platform where you're able to have those conversations and make those connections effectively. Uh, there's also, I think, a lot of concerns that surface sometimes in terms of the tension between uh, isn't, isn't drug use against the law, so why are you setting up a program that seems to contradict some of our broader efforts? Now, we've seen a lot of examples of programs working in really close collaboration with law enforcement in their communities. Uh, North Carolina just last year passed their syringe exchange law, and a lot of that was with the support of the law enforcement community in the state because the harm reduction advocates there had partnered with law enforcement on reducing needle stick injuries. If you're an officer mm -hmm. and you're Cold searching, if accurate. you're patting somebody down or searching your car trunk, you're worried about getting stuck by a syringe. Right. If you're stuck by a syringe, are you gonna get HIV or hepatitis C from it? 
this levels the playing field so that people don't feel afraid to disclose, oh, be careful, there might be a needle here. If you know that the, the syringe that you have is legal, then you're not afraid of somebody necessarily, you, you don't want to hide that, so you want to make it safe for everybody, so you disclose that you have that. Similarly, in North Carolina, they worked very closely between a uh, strong harm, harm reduction law enforcement partnership on overdose prevention. They trained and equipped law enforcement, the harm reduction advocates, to say, this is how you respond to an overdose. We're going to actually provide you with the naloxone because what we hear from law enforcement officers is if they're the first to show up right. before EMS gets there, it's that painful three minutes, four minutes of waiting and you feel helpless to do something and you are, am I watching somebody die because I didn't have naloxone with me? Uh, similarly, harm reduction and syringe exchange programs in North Carolina are now working with some, uh, some police departments on diversion programs, recognizing that a lot of the people that get caught up in jails and law enforcement for things like petty crimes, um, uh, it's driven by their drug use. And the solution isn't necessarily incarceration. That's not going to address the underlying issue. The solution is to get them the services that they need to reduce their recidivism and their chances of success improve if they're actually linked to services rather than just incarcerated. So we've seen strong partnerships, North Carolina being an example, between harm reduction programs and law enforcement in many fronts. So these two don't have to be at odds with each other. They're not necessarily antithetical. There could be some solid partnerships. Uh, so these collaborations, I think, are also important to send a signal to people who might want to access a syringe services program that they can do so without fearing that it's some kind of trap, some kind of sting operation, some kind of setup. So it's really important to send signals you know, at, at all levels that this has to be something that's done it with the support of the broader community whether that's the law enforcement community, the business community, the healthcare, the treatment community, that this isn't just we're going we're gonna to set up a program over here. This really has to blend into the fabric of the community, and those linkages and those collaborations and those buy-ins are so critical for its effectiveness. Now, uh, it was mentioned earlier, the Scott County, Indiana HIV outbreak, which I think most people are familiar with. Back starting in uh, late 2014, probably early 2015, Scott County, a relatively rural area, uh, southeastern Indiana, uh, knew that they had a significant drug problem, knew that they had a lot of people who were misusing prescription opioid painkillers, injecting prescription opioid painkillers. What started showing up was these HIV cases, these HIV infections in a town that did not have a whole lot of HIV. By the end of the HIV outbreak, roughly 200 people in this small community, a population of about 4,000 overall, so 5% of the population had HIV as a result of injection drug use. They did not have a syringe exchange program there. They didn't have a whole lot of drug treatment available in that region. Um, and they had to really think quickly about how to contain this. That sparked the conversation with CDC about if this could happen in Scott County, where else could it happen? And you heard from the previous speaker that CDC's identified some counties in Georgia that have all the conditions right for a similar outbreak of HIV or a rapid increase in hepatitis C cases. We've also seen a huge increase in heroin overdose deaths across the country since 2010, and more recently an emer emergence of illicit fentanyl analogs, fentanyl being yeah. a potent opioid that is implicated in a huge increase in overdose mortality in places like Ohio, places like Massachusetts. Uh, I was just hearing that they're seeing it in northern Kentucky and West Virginia as well. So this is what the, the portrait looks like. Risks of HIV outbreaks, rapid increase in hepatitis C, and even greater overdose deaths. These programs provide the front lines, the early intervention, the rapid response. Their ears are to the ground because they're talking to people who use drugs every day. They're able to get information out, they're able to get tools out, and they're able to bring them into these broader systems of care and treatment that can help turn things around. When we see that there's a rise in acute hepatitis C infections, that's the canary in the coal mine. 
that's the signal that there's a growing problem that we need to try to get in front of. And even acute hepatitis B among, among adults. We are vaccinating youth for hepatitis B, but there's adults who miss that vaccination and they're at risk of getting hepatitis B either through multiple sex partners or through injection drug use. Endocarditis also, an infection that attacks the heart valves, is very common among people who inject drugs who don't have access to sterile injection supplies. And neonatal abscess syndrome, which is another consequence if, uh, if a pregnant woman is dependent on opioids, you want to have some form of early intervention to connect with her, get her connected to prenatal care, and improve those birth outcomes. And I'll just mention uh, for some comparison with the Georgia uh, acute hepatitis C data, which we heard a little while ago, for this population of uh, people younger than 30, um, the CDC worked with state health departments in Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia to look back between 2006 and 2012 at what was happening with their new hepatitis C infection, so their acute diagnoses. And what they found was a dramatic spike and similar to the pattern that we're seeing in Georgia, it was mostly outside of urban settings. It was mostly uh, among younger white people in this age who were injecting drugs. Uh, there was a relative split between male and female uh, that's comparable to Georgia, but that canary in the coal mine, these trends will continue to accelerate. All of these states, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia, since this data, since 2012, have passed legislation to start syringe exchange programs. Kentucky in 2015, Tennessee and Virginia this year, West Virginia started their first programs in 2015 as well. So these are how other states with similar <coughs> epidemiological profiles are responding to these challenges and they're starting to see results. So I'll end there, but I'm happy to take questions and thank you for your time. Thank you for a very thorough presentation. I are you saying that in some places to overcome prejudice against the drug users and the needle exchange, I think, was I hearing you that some places that, that you, your harm production groups actually have sort of a more comprehensive program? Do they actually yeah. have a place where people can go and where they can, and they offer these other services and help? Yeah, I think that's, there's a spectrum of ways of, of implementing these programs. So for example, you can have a drop-in center, right? So that gives an opportunity to offer vaccination services on site. You'll have maybe a case manager with a desk and a phone to see if somebody needs to go into a treatment program to make some calls and space to have group education, dialogue, there are also programs that operate on mobile units, like mobile health vans. Um, and there's, so, uh, there's a variety of ways, but the idea is that it's not just a mechanism to distribute injection supplies, it's a mechanism to find ways to connect to people, counsel people, and offer them support. Okay, because I think, the, I think the, uh, the vision that some people hold on the needle exchange is that they were just gonna go out and go under the you know, byways and mm -hmm. on the and hunt up the homeless people and just hand them a, a clean syringe and then just let them continue to be homeless and nothing is going to be done. It seems like it might be easier for j us to get over this stigma that it's they're just going to lay in the park across the street or wherever you go mm -hmm. to and we're just facilitating their drug use if there was a more comprehensive, you know, yeah. program that offered more and I'm thinking if we could do a couple of pilot studies in some of the places where it is you know most likely to the red areas and so forth that are so heavily that that m and show the reduction that we might be able to move forward with a bigger program or something so uh, I mean because yeah. I, I think that's our problem well I will offer that every program that I've worked with uh, across the country virtually wants to offer as many services as possible. Sometimes they're constrained by resources and sometimes they are constrained because they haven't quite gotten over that hurdle of skepticism from the community. But in Kentucky, for example, 
Most of the programs that have opened up over the last couple of years are run by health departments. That's similar in West Virginia, but we're also seeing community health centers open up programs. And once you get the health department or the health center involved, then you can offer more of those health services. You, uh, West Virginia has some programs that have brought in recovery coaches. I visited a program in West Virginia that has, uh, has reproductive health care services, so pregnancy testing and linking somebody to an OBGYN in prenatal care if they're pregnant. So I think it's not so much a question of how you design the programs because all of the programs want to offer as much as possible. It's about making those connections and making sure the resources are there to support that. Well, where do the resources come from in, in, in these states? I mean, the, the state appropriating it, or are there grants available through the CDC, or where do you find, or is yeah. the community, you know, coming in a public-private partnership, or? Yeah, there's uh, it's a variety. In, Kentucky is one state that is, has put in a little bit of, of their dollars. West Virginia has also used some of their federal dollars uh, that were authorized last year by Congress under the 21st Century Cures Act. And so a portion of those dollars went out through the federal agency, the Federal Substance Abuse Agency, SAMHSA, for opioid state targeted response grants. So, uh, so there's some access to federal funds. There are opportunities. Uh, a few states have used some of their CDC dollars for it. There's private foundations that are supporting this, um, and then in some places, state or local health departments have supported it as well as private donations. I see. Okay, Dr. Walsh. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and yes, Mr. Rain, and yeah, th th this is your harm reduction uh, program sounds like it has great potential. And with the states that you mentioned that have passed the needle exchange of legislation, do, does that legislation typically have language that, that could be described as components of, of harm reduction or, uh, or not? It varies. Sometimes states do that through okay. legislation, and um, I think a little more often states do that through uh, regulation or guidance. So the purpose of the legislation is largely to resolve perceived contradictions between the public health mission of these programs and underlying uh, drug paraphernalia laws in the penal code. Um, so most states have, uh, have laws on the books that distribution of drug paraphernalia or sale or possession is a crime. And so the laws that these states pass are a way of saying, well, actually to serve this broader public health goal, we're going to exempt these programs and the people using them from these laws. Um, so, for example, I worked with Kentucky. After they passed their law, we talked to members of the legislature and advocates in that state, and then the health department asked us to help them come up with guidance about what they want their programs to look like in Kentucky. What are these components and that you should consider offering these services? If you can't offer them yourselves, you should find either collaborations or referral mechanisms. So most states don't carve, carve out the, all of the services, strictly speaking, in legislation, but there is some kind of oversight function to make sure that you're, you're, you're setting the bar high. Well, thank you. Now, I had one, one other sure. question, yes. Y you know, we, you, you touched on, on cost. Mm -hmm. it, it, is there any analysis out there of, of cost benefit of the uh, harm reduction programs? Yeah, I've seen analyses that if you only look at the HIV prevention cost savings, so not even looking at hepatitis C or endocarditis or overdose, that these programs, for every dollar you spend, they save five to seven dollars. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can provide that research okay. to the committee. Thank you. And um, Leo looked up the research from North Carolina, and their, their research is showing that over 90% of the syringes uh, distributed through the needle exchange are returned to them and not out on the street or yeah. being hidden or in our trash or that can injuring all sorts of people, pretty, pretty mm -hmm. significant. Dr. O'Neill, welcome. You're behind the column over there. What is this with public health that likes to sit behind columns? <laughs> 
Dr. O'Neill, on SAMHSA and their drug money, did that come to our public health department? Did we get any? No, that came to DBHCD. Ah, your friend sitting in front of you. <laughs> okay, has it been all used up, or is that a... Yes, ma'am, and I have an itemized list that I can send you where, where all that money's been allocated. For drug okay. use reduction? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I understand the CDC got a big pot too. Maybe they haven't used all of theirs yet. Okay, uh, Representative Price. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to refer anyone who hasn't seen it, um, House Bill 161 last year that I introduced, which basically decriminalizes harm reduction organizations. And it was, uh, there was no fiscal note on it because uh, it, it is just allowing it to happen, making it not illegal for a harm reduction organization to, to um, participate in needle exchanges. And as I understood it, that there were entities out there that would not allow, not require state funding to do, to accomplish this. So um, it's in the works, um, and I'm hoping that we'll uh, get beyond the hurdles that have prevented it from moving forward last year. Where is that bill right now? It was recommitted, I believe it's in the House? It's in the House. Mm -hmm. It's in the House and it was mm -hmm. recommitted, made the rules? Yes. Made the rules, okay. I think. Okay. We'll, we'll check. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. So um, we're trying, just trying to get over the stigma of what's being said about how it's gonna pass or what it's gonna do. And I think it's because of the visual picture of people who've seen uh, the visions from Europe and are having trouble getting past those. And those are pretty devastating when you see all of these young people just laid out, stoned out of their minds, and they've been handed needles and so forth. It's really pretty sad and pretty devastating. Yeah, I, 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 I can understand that concern. And I think sometimes when we talk about some of these strategies, they might at first seem counterintuitive. Um, but I think just like we know that we don't have enough hepatitis C treatment that most people who are getting diagnosed aren't getting linked and followed up or because of financial constraints. We also know that we don't currently, no state in this country has ample supply of drug treatment. Right. And much as we would wish for better, much as we want to restore hope and dignity to people who are suffering with these, these issues, that's gonna be a process. It's often a journey and it's not always a smooth one or in one direction. People will slip and people will relapse and harm reduction offers a bit of a net to hold them while they're struggling until we can help move them forward. Well, I think I re I, that I read something recently that drug users fail less time than people with diabetes fail in getting their diabetes under control. Um, I haven't seen that, but that wouldn't surprise me. Right, that they're actually more successful. I mean, they do fail, but less times um, with treatment than the people with diabetes. And I have a sister in Texas that that's certainly true. Um, so, and all the consequences that go with it. But I think the consequences of the untreated part, uh, one of the problems with state, we do a two-year budget and we're in for two years and people are concerned about what happens in those two years and it's hard to get people to allocate funds because we're gonna have people that need liver replacements mm -hmm. in a few years, 20 years down the road, if they don't get treatment, but it's sort of like that's somebody else's problem, I won't be here in 20 years, and uh, you know, it, 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 they don't see the value of taking it out of the budget now. I mean, I'm, as le I'm talking about legislators, not okay. as we, it's the more what's right needed right now, not what's gonna help us save money uh, down the pike, unfortunately, in the prevention field. I think we run into that a lot mm -hmm. uh, with, with problems. Other questions? Thank you very much, and thank you very thank much you. for coming. And any information that you can give to Kathleen, provide for yeah. us that um, of any of the real successful programs that have sort of a more comprehensive program would be really helpful I'd as we go that. forward um, in trying to move a bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sheila Lovett, and it's an overview of our immunization transactions and services. The grits, are yes. we getting people in the, in the, on the grits or out on the web or whatever it is so we can tell who's 
been immunized? We are. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. I am Sheila Lovett. I'm the Program Director for Immunizations with the Department of Public Health. Um, I am going to give a brief overview of our GRIT system, which is the Georgia Registry of Immunization Transactions and Services. Um, just a little background. Georgia has actually had a registry law since the mid-1990s, I believe 1996. The registry itself was not um, released until 2003, and at that time it was just a childhood immunization registry. In 2004, House Bill um, 1526 was passed, and this was it. Now the registry became a child, a birth to death registry, and so Georgia is one of the only states with this birth to death registry, one of the few states with a birth to death registry that is supported by Georgia law. Um, so the, the registry basically was designed to um, provide a centralized location for providers to administer immunizations to have this one place to put the immunizations into a um, web-based system that can be access accessed by other providers throughout the state of Georgia and even some of our neighboring states who serve Georgia res residents also have access to the um, registry as well. Um, um, there are many benefits associated with the registry, which includes, again, that centralized place for providers to access immunization records of their patients. Um, it provides an accurate history of the database, I mean, of the immunization histories. It reduces missed opportunities from vaccines. Um, <laughs> Uh, providers are able to see exactly what vaccines are needed each time a person goes into the visit. Um, the system is designed to actually provide a pop-up that will say today these vaccines are due for this patient. Um, it also reduces the time that it takes for um, the clinic staff to actually create immunization records for schools, um, college. The system actually generates those records for those purposes as well, and then it assists us um, with um, disease outbreaks and investigations, or even if a vaccine manufacturer recalls a certain vaccine, we can look into the registry, we can run a report for anyone in the state of Georgia that may have received that specific lot number of that vaccine and actually recall if necessary for revaccination um, or provide whatever guidance is needed at that time. It's a resource for parents, although parents in Georgia do not have access to the registry, they are able to either go to their schools or to go to their physician's office and they are able to print um, immunization records and history for children um, or themselves um, from the registry as well. And then it also helps them to ensure that the correct number of immunizations are provided so there's no over vaccination or under vaccination for Georgia residents. So this is just to show that we are one of the largest registries in the U.S. We have over 163 million immunization um, entries actually in the system for 14.3 million residents in Georgia. We have over 13,000 provider or organizations who are registered and have access to the registry. Those provider organizations will include physicians, public and private, who administer the immunizations. It also includes schools, daycare centers, colleges and universities, um, and even some insurance providers because they access data for their uh, HEDIS reporting purposes. We have, within those 13,000 organizations, over 35,000 individual users who access this data. Um, and then, on an average, um, over 11,000 um, entries or logins per day. Another thing that the GRIT system is able to do is actually communicate with provider electronic medical record systems or health record systems. Um, they can actually either upload data um, manually, just upload a file to the registry, or they can have 
a direct exchange from their system to the registry via either the batch HL7, which is a language that is used to code and secure the information or encrypt the information from one system to the other, or a real-time exchange, meaning any time a provider enters the information into their registry, it automatically is uploaded without the provider having to do anything manually to our registry as well. So GRITS, outside of just housing immunization information for our residents here in Georgia, it also has other functions that are immunization related. So we have um, the option for providers who are in our Vaccines for Children program, which is VFC, or our adult vaccine program. We do have a small adult vaccine um, program with about 13 federally qualified health centers enrolled in that program. They can actually um, report and order vaccines from our office through the registry. They can also manage inventory, and that's not only for the providers who are in our program, but any provider who has access to the registry. They can manage their inventory level, so every time a dose is given, it automatically deducts from their inventory. Um, this is done automatically for our providers who receive vaccines from the public health immunization program. As soon as the vaccines are received, that information is automatically downloaded by our staff into the registry, so it automatically will start to deduct as the vaccines are administered in the clinic. And then we also do currently some new enhancements that are in the pipeline um, would include our coverage report assessments. So we do provider level coverage reports to see what the immunization rates are for provider offices. We don't do it for all providers, but when we implement this coverage reporting function in GRITS, and that will actually go live in January, any provider who uses the system to manage their inventory and deduct the vaccines that they've given from that inventory will be able to run a report Right now, we use a system that is a CDC system called COCASA. The data is actually pulled out of the registry and put into CDC's system to run the coverage reports. We will no longer have to do that in January. We'll be able to put whatever age category we want to put in that system right into the registry, and it will generate the reports. And it could be done at the state level and then also at the individual provider level as well. So that will be released in January. That is our GRITS overview. But I was also asked to talk about the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or who we refer to as ACIP. And so this is a committee of about 15 voting members who have expertise in certain um, immunization-related fields, uh, vaccine, vaccinology, immunology, infectious disease, pediatrics, internal medicine, preventive medicine, public health, and then just some consumer uh, perspectives from the population that we serve. And what their main responsibility is related to immunizations is to actually develop the immunization schedules and make recommendations for which vaccines we should receive, how many doses of those vaccines, and at what interval. And so this is just an example of one of the immunization charts. And so there are a number of bars and colors. And sometimes you have to be um, a genius to understand what some of this means. But there are also pages and pages of footnotes that kind of explains all of this to us. But just basic, briefly, I'm going to go to the next one because it has an extra category. This is the adult immunization schedule. And this schedule is by um, chronic disease or health um, condition, and what it means is anything in yellow is actually recommended for the population, um, and then anything in purple is what may be recommended, may or may not be recommended based on your health condition, and then if it is in red, it's something that that person should not receive because it's contraindicated for that specific condition that they may have. So just briefly, the recommended vaccines for the adult population, I've listed here on this slide, and it is, of course, an annual dose of influenza. Anyone six months and older should receive a, a flu shot once a year. Um, two doses of Hep A based on your risk, hepatitis A vaccine. Three doses of hepatitis B 
based on um, risk as well for 19 to 59 year olds. Um, herpes zoster or more familiar is the shingles vaccine. It depends on which vaccine. A new vaccine was just approved by ACIP in October. And so based on which vaccine you, need, you receive, it would be either a one or two dose series. Um, and then also the age requirement is actually lower for the newer vaccine, Shingrix. Shingrix, they lowered it to 50 years and older for that population. And then HPV, three doses for adults 19 through 26 years old, one dose of MMR or two doses, depending on what your risk may be if you're a student traveling abroad or a healthcare worker. Pneumococcal vaccine, there are two pneumococcal vaccines that are recommended. One covers 13 strains of pneumococcal and then the other 23 strains and they are both required to be administered for persons 65 years and older and separated by eight weeks. TD and Tdap is also recommended for adults, one dose, with a, a one dose of Tdap with a booster of TD every 10 years, and that is for tetanus and pertussis, and then varicella as well. For anyone who does not have a previous history of the chicken pox, they should receive two doses also um, eight weeks apart. So the vaccines that I actually have listed in red with the asterisks, they are pediatric vaccines as well or recommended for the pediatric population. And they are also school required vaccines. So there are, these are newer recommendations. So we still have a large number of adults who may or may not have had these vaccines. But in a few years, because they are required for school entry in Georgia, most of the adults will already be immune. HPV is, or vaccinated, I'll say that. And HPV is actually an adolescent vaccine as well, but if you did not receive it when um, ACIP recommended for that 11 and 12 year old population, then it is recommended for adults up to 26 years of age. But not all of these are yearly. No. No, the one, I mean. The only one that's yearly is influenza, so that once a year is for the flu vaccine. Right. Okay. So this is just a graph. In Georgia, we actually look at coverage for um, flu vaccine and pneumococcal for those that are 65 years of age or older. And this is just coverage of our immunization rates for the flu vaccine. And the darker areas are the areas in Georgia with lower coverage rates. However, we are below as, as a whole, a total, our coverage rates are low for Georgia, so we are working hard to educate and try to help increase the rates for this population here. And the same with pneumococcal, still fairly low. Some areas are as high as 80% coverage rates, but the majority of Georgia states are around 60%, which is still fairly low. And again, the darker the color, the lower the coverage rates. But our rates for pneumococcal are much higher than flu, and typically, um, mm -hmm. When these are administered, they are administered around the same time because adults are in to get that flu shots. A lot of doctors will try to go ahead and administer the pneumonia shots as well. Can you, has there been an uptick? And we keep passing for the hospitals to be able to give, you know, shots if the patients are in the hospital in a certain age. Um, so I don't have data related to any hospital specific administration data. It is something that we can access because they do report to the registry. Okay. So that is something that we can obtain to just see if we see a difference over the last couple of years. Okay, because mm -hmm. we keep getting, allowing them to give them at different places and. Right. So one of the main challenges, and this is from the patient's perspective, um, to receiving adult immunizations or adult vaccinations is that providers are not recommending it or they're not making a strong enough recommendation. So a lot of pro providers do would mention, and again, this is from the patient's perspective, a lot of providers do mention the vaccines, but they don't really stress the importance of them actually receiving the vaccine. And so if, if providers would say, hey, you need this vaccine, um, it's going to help for it, whatever the reason may be, patients will more likely receive it. But because they don't push it hard, they just say, okay, thank you for the information, and they don't, no one, they don't want to be, get a shot, basically. 
Um, these are just the recommended vaccinations for adolescents and much smaller than the group that I've shown before. And again, it's the annual dose for the flu vaccine. The HPV is recommended at 11 to 12 years old of age. Um, and then meningococcal vaccine or MCV4 is also recommended for 11 to 12 years of age. And it is actually required for school entry as is the Tdap. So that is why meningococcal and Tdap, by the time this group of young adults reach adulthood, they, they won't need that dose um, as listed on the previous slide. So they would have already had it because it's required for school entry. What we also encourage providers to do, HPV is not required for school entry, but we do ask that they bundle the vaccines so it doesn't stand out alone by itself. And so we have actually seen, and I believe it's on the next slide, we've actually seen increases in our HPV rates from last year. Our rate for that first dose for females was 50% and this year is actually 77%. So we saw a huge increase. We've been doing a lot of education around the vaccine and working with providers and, and parents. We've had some um, programs where parents could come in, attend and learn more about the vaccine as well. And then just again, encouraging providers to group them or bundle this vaccine with the other two that are actually required for school entry. But across the board, you'll see that Georgia's rates are not only above national averages, but they're also above the averages in our region. So we are doing fairly well, making great improvements um, with our adolescent vaccines. And so we're proud of that. Can we go back to the yes. one slide while, so I can, on this uh, serogroup, uh, the B yes. meningococcal? So meningococcal vaccine, serogroup B. Is, is that the one we have with our college students and yeah. all that is so, so MCV4 and meningococcal B are recommended for that group. Um, but meningococcal B is really recommended as a routine recommendation for high risk patients over the age of 10, but it's also recommended for anyone who 10 and above who um, may be in close contact with someone or with the, with the virus itself. So it is recommended. Uh, we don't have any man school mandated recommendations associated with that at this time. But they're still putting it out like in, for students going into college? So that's the MCV4, but Menage B, which is the Sarah Group B one, is also starting to pick up um, push for college students as well. But not at Menage Cockle, the MCV4 one is the one that is definitely uh, recommended for college students, anyone entering college students. Which one is more in preventing that very devastating one when they are? That's Menin that's Sarah Group B. So that is the one, and that is why it is picking up a lot of momentum now for making sure that our college students are immune. On that one? Yes. Because of the devastating? Mm hmm Okay. So is that it? That, yep, that was my last slide, so. <laughs> Okay, any, I mean, as y'all talk about things over in public health, is there any recommendations for, I mean, having better coverage or do you just think it's an educational? So it, it's definitely educational and we are now, in addition to just educating the general population, we're now being faced with a lot of vaccine hesitant groups. So we are trying to educate that population as well. And in turn, they're trying to educate us, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, mainly on the childhood? Mm -hmm. Yes. Not so much as not the adults. So, no adults and not even adolescents really. So a few years ago there was a challenge with the HPV vaccine, but we're not even faced with that challenge at this point. Just, just, just the pediatric vaccines, specifically MMR and varicella, which are what I did not mention. Some of the vaccines are live vaccines. It's a weakened form of the actual live va virus, and that's the varicella and the MMR. And that's the one that the, yes. it has the greatest resistance. Right. What are they doing about, I thought it, if it's required for school, how do they get their child in public schools if they're not vaccinated? So we have a religious exemption in uh -huh. Georgia. And so but what happens with our religious exemption, you can't just exempt to the varicella and the MMR, you exempt to all vaccines. 
So they have to actually do an affidavit saying that it because of due to their religious beliefs that and that's how they're receiving. Yes. Okay. But I will say too, we are still even with this resistance, our coverage rates for school is over ninety percent, which is very good. And our religious exemption rate is less than one percent. So Okay. Better than are we for once not on the bottom for We're states? much better than a, not, a number of states. <laughs> that's really good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean on some okay, Representative Price. Thank you. I have to remember what my question was. Uh, I guess one of, one of my questions is, is uh, oh, I know, it was the two maps. Uh, on the elderly receiving flu or um, pneumococcus. And it's interesting that an area that's least likely to receive the flu shot is in a higher group of getting the pneumococcal. I mean, it seems like they would go hand in hand. So what, what are the differences in the state regarding so why people do or don't get the, uh, the vaccines? Biggest, the biggest reason is really, really simple. So a lot of people believe that the flu vaccine will give them the flu. So they are more resistant to receiving that vaccine. So the number of people who will not receive a flu immunization, they believe it's because they will get the flu from it. And they don't think the other will give them pneumonia? No. <laughs> That's oh, the, that is the okay. real reason. <laughs> so it's, it's not unlikely for us to see that. Will you get pneumonia? And, and what about other vaccines in general? What what is the, the <sighs> um, penetration of, of receptance? So we we don't collect actual coverage data for the other vaccines. We only look at the flu and the pneumonia, pneumonia vaccines or the pneumococcal vaccines. Um, what again with the grits enhancement that we are implementing, adults is a population, that is a population we'll be able to actually look at coverage rates moving forward. So we'll, that will become available in January. And this data actually comes from um, the Behavioral Risk Surveillance Survey, and that is um, a survey that is completed by CDC. And so they actually do phone interviews to see, hey, have you received this vaccine? So if they remember they received the vaccine, then they record, yes, they now, have. Now, taking that, that map, again, of, of, of uh, the self-reporting that received mm -hmm. the vaccination, have we compared that to the actual incidence or prevalence of, of the condition on an annual basis? So we have not. That may, ha may be something that our um, flu surveillance coordinator has done. She sits with our EPI program, so I don't know if, Sherry, if you would know if they've compared that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Walsh. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your report there, Ms. Lovett. Um, <clears throat> one of my questions has to do with, uh, with the grits, um, the, the reporting. I understand that there can be a, like an automatic uh, upload. Um, is, is the information bi-directional? Um, so if a, if a provider is hooked up to that grits, do they do they get uh, information out of grits uh, for a patient that may have been, you know, vaccinated at, at another location? Right. So as of right now, it is not bidirectional. So it is capable to have that bio, bidirectional exchange, but because of security reasons, it has not, it's not active. Mm -hmm. So what we have done is we are a part of the Georgia HIN, and so grits is information that we share with that system so any member of that system will have access and they will have that bi-directional interface capability thank you mm -hmm. okay I, and I, I guess i have one more question and thank you for your report would be for a while we were having a shortage of the vaccines especially since i mean you have your physicians uh, when people come in and you said you know about how strongly they encourage or not but for a while the physicians couldn't get it mm -hmm. um, partly because it was being bought up by large, what was available was being bought up by large 
pharmacies and so forth, and the actual physicians couldn't get it for their office. Are we still having that problem? And if we are, with, with which vaccine? Right. So, uh, so at this time, we do not have any vaccine shortages. So all of the vaccines um, are available. And even if there is a shortage of one particular brand, there is an alternate brand that can be used in that in place of that. So we haven't had any issues with not being able to provide vaccines from the public side. The private side might be different. So we all because the public side actually they we get preference for vaccines. So sometimes when there are shortages, we have priority. So we receive the vaccines first. Do all our public health facilities, I think there's one in every county or almost every county, mm -hmm. do they all provide vaccinations? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. of and all they, the they provide pediatric and adult vaccinations of all ACIP recommended vaccines. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we charge for that? They will. And so even in our public program, well, so the, for the public side, they are allowed to charge for administration of the vaccine, but not the vaccine itself, because that's vaccine provided by the federal government to our state to give to our public health clinics and providers. But they can charge up to $21.93 per dose for that vaccine. And that, for adults, would only color, cover underinsured and uninsured adults. But for the private side, they do have what they, we call county purchase supply, they are allowed to charge for the cost of that vaccine and the administration of that vaccine, so that can get expensive. But in addition, our public health clinics are also able to, they're able to bill certain immunization providers for administration of that vaccine, so they can bill. And in that case, they won't bill the patient. If they have insurance, they'll bill the insurance okay. company. Is there any way for us to tell in each of these units how often, I mean, because, you know, I, Sometimes when I talk about public health, and Dr. O'Neill, I'm trying, I'm not, you're new, I'm not trying, <laughs> they'll say that every time they drive by the public health department, there's nobody there. So. And so I wonder what the utilization is if, you know, on the local level, if we're, if public health is pro advertising it enough, and I don't mean paid advertisement, but however you get the word out, I'm wondering about the utilization through our public health departments because y'all are out there in almost every county. Right. So I'll take a stab at that. Okay. <laughs> That's all I can ask for. So uh, it really depends on what the season is as well. So flu season, if you go to a public health clinic, they're probably crowded right now okay. because they're doing a lot of flu vaccines. And then when you go during back to school season or back to school rush, a number of vaccines is crowded. Sometimes the lines start at seven in the morning just for people to get into the clinic to get those vaccines. So it really depends on what is actually going on and what's, what the population needs. But they do a lot of outreach, so they do a lot of health fairs, so they do a lot of taking the immunizations to the community and not depending on them to actually come in to the clinic as well. Dr. O'Neill, you wanna to add to that? Yes, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. Come on up, you're, you're next anyway. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there are some really sad situations, particularly in rural Georgia. Uh, I was talking to the only physician in uh, Clay County last week and uh, found out that uh, she was interested in looking at whether or not she could utilize the public health clinic for some of her private patients because uh, a good part of the time the clinic was not occupied. And the issue is that we have three counties down there, Clay and two adjoining counties, that share one nurse. So each county, well, two of the counties get that nurse for two days a week. One of the counties gets that nurse for one day a week. That's public health nurses. That's the shortage of public health nurses in Georgia. Okay. And that's part and of that's, the And that's part of why you can drive by a county health department and see nothing there. Okay. which is horrific from my perspective. Right. Well, I know that we gave them a little bit of a raise. I'm sure it's not near enough, but hopefully it It was help, a very them. Uh, substantial raise, and it's much appreciated. Uh, we still have great difficulty attracting nurses to certain parts of the state. 
in our rural counties? Well, I mean, there's a shortage, just like doctors. I mean, they're not nurses in a large degree in many of the counties, or PAs, or nurse practitioners. They're just not there. And, I mean, I think Dr. O'Neill, it's just, some of the places just don't offer what where people want to live. And doctors and PAs and nurse practitioners have spouses that are professionals, and they're, you know, they want jobs and Sometimes there's just not jobs in these rural areas. Absolutely. Having been on this council and going around, it's it's just a problem we're having. Yes. And I'm not sure how we're going to change it. So, I mean, well, since you're already up there, <laughs> do you still like your job as commissioner of public <laughs> health? <laughs> I love my job as commissioner of public health. Okay, because, I mean, uh, after doing it, what now, six months or something? It's uh, about five months. Five months like but, that? Uh, it was an easy transition. As you probably know, Dr. Fitzgerald was the rising president of ASTO, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, when she was tapped to go to CDC. But for that year that she was the rising president, she had to be out of state a lot. And I covered for her during most of her trips out of state. So it really was a fairly smooth transition. Uh, the only real difficulty was that she took her chief of staff with her. Uh, so we had to make some changes. I had to bring in a new chief of staff. And I utilized that person a bit differently from the way she had utilized Jamie. Well, but, uh, I told David, and since he's assistant chief of staff, he can't sit behind the poles anymore. <laughs> has to be up where we can see him and ask him questions. I got him, so in case he tells you that afterwards. Well, you know, what can we do to improve outcomes? I mean, I'm very concerned about the hepatitis C epidemic. I mean, 14,000-plus cases for a year. I, I mean, it's just overwhelming, and... Uh, our drug, you know, our drug problem. I think we've passed a lot of bills here, as far as trying to help our doctors understand the need to, you know, go and check the PDMP and to not order as many and so forth. But I understand the pills are coming in from uh, China and Mexico, and uh, as Bill Bennett said, the former drugs are under Daddy Bush. You know, we need a little help from law enforcement and everybody to hit it from all. At, um, sides it's not just one we can't just beat up on the physicians and think mm. that they're the whole cause of the problem and uh not stop the flow of the ones from china and the opioids from china and so so i'm real interested in, so what can we do to be, do better let me mention the three priorities that uh, brenda left us with because they're still our priorities and i want to honor those throughout governor deal's term okay. uh, and it will address part of the discussion you were having there uh, the first priority, I think, uh, is ultimately going to be the most helpful that we'll see in Georgia, but we're not going to see it soon enough for most people to really realize the benefit. And that's the emphasis that Brenda had placed on early brain development. The data out of Harvard is absolutely compelling. And if, in fact, we do a far better job of developing our young ones' brains early on, we're going to see far better performance in school. We're going to see better graduation rates, ultimately. We're going to see lowering of poverty rates as those individuals become productive. But that's going to be years ahead. And the problem when you have that many years is we all have short-term memory loss or long-term memory loss in many instances. <laughs> and uh, we lose track of, of what brought this about. But I honestly think that uh, early brain development, particularly language nutrition, uh, is absolutely critical. Proper food nutrition is also critical, and exercise is critical, obviously, as a child is developing. And we've got multiple programs in public health that are dealing with this, from the Talk With Me Baby program all the way up to uh, uh, farm to school uh, produce being brought in. All of those things are going to make a difference, but they're not going to make it soon enough for most of us to realize the value, unfortunately, certainly not at my age. But others, hopefully, will see tremendous improvement. I think, uh, you know, a term that's thrown around that's not well liked by a lot of folks is social determinants. And those social determinants of health, I think, can be addressed probably best by early brain development. And I think if there is a fantastic legacy that Brenda, uh, the First Lady, and Governor Deal will leave to Georgia, 
It's going to be emphasis on that. And I think she will continue to push it from the federal level at CDC See. as we're pushing it with our multiple programs here in Georgia. Please tell me that the bill I passed and took so much heat from the boys over on getting people who really know what they're doing to help women breastfeed when they're having problems helps. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, because I, I, I got sick of hearing it's a natural process, and my girlfriend told me that she breastfed her babies and nobody needs to have somebody, you know, that they know how to do it. It's a natural thing. You don't need this <laughs> bill. So, and then those are the ones that didn't turn red and stammer because you're talking about breastfeeding. So, thank you. I'm glad to know that. No, we so greatly just, appreciate that. In fact, I mentioned that this morning in the Children's Cabinet with the First Lady, so thank you. Thank you. I mean, because it's really, they, you know, you'd have thought that our guys in the legislature, even though they're married, had never seen a breast or you're not supposed to talk about it. So it was uh, four years of being really ribbed about that one. So, thank you. Go ahead. I'm this, sorry. The, there were three priorities that Brenda left us with, and I've added a fourth, but the, the second priority gets back to your question about the uh, opioid crisis that we're dealing with. And public health has, I think, an important role, but it's probably not nearly as important as some of our partners. Our role is, is really primarily twofold. One, the PDMP. We have got to make it more user-friendly. We have got to make it easy for physicians to utilize it in their workflow, not as a separate portal that they have to go into. Right. And that's going to cost a bit of money to develop that interface, but I, I really feel that that's critical. PDMP and using that data effectively is a charge of public health that, that we're really determined to do something effective with. The other thing that we're charged with is writing the overall state strategy for dealing with the crisis from prevention all the way through the rehab process and continuation. That doesn't mean that public health does that. It means we, we write the strategy, but it's terribly important that it not be a public health strategy. This needs to be a statewide strategy. So we've got to involve multiple stakeholders in this. We have already created the straw man strategy. And based on some information that the feds had provided for us, it was very helpful in sort of getting a general feeling of what needed to be in the strategy based on success in some other areas. Uh, but what we're doing right now, you may be aware that the Attorney General convened a group about four weeks ago, right. I think, uh, I was dumbfounded at the amount of activity that's already underway in Georgia from multiple agencies and multiple organizations that are not even state agencies that have been addressing this issue to some degree, not necessarily fully by any means, for the last couple of years or more. And where we are right now is we're going back. I met with Attorney General Carr last week, and I asked him would he have any objections to us contacting every one of those presenters. There were 32 out of 34 that he had invited. And I said, would you have any problem if we meet with each of those? Because I want them to tell me where do they fit in what we think the strategy should look like. And if they don't fit, tell us what we need to do to change our model so that they can fit if they're doing good work. We hope by December 31st to have completed meetings with all those 32, actually the two that didn't show up also, 34. Uh, the next step is after we've gotten input from all those folks, we want to select probably six or seven folks that basically have influence over maybe three or four of the other presenters in some way, some alli uh, allegiance or alliance between them so that one person can come and be part of a working group with us to continue to essentially massage that plan and figure out, okay, how do we get maximum investment, engagement by all the stakeholders so that it becomes everybody's plan, not public health plan, but everybody's plan. And it's gonna involve so many different partners, obviously. The prevention side, I think, is, is terribly underfunded on the on the federal side right now. That 11.7 or 8 million that uh, SAMHSA gave to uh, DBHDD, I think only about 300,000 of it is allocated for prevention. prevention. Right. And yet, uh, prevention gives us our greatest return on investment. So we need a lot more prevention effort, working with the education community, starting very young, 
not where we start now, but way down in the early grades, I think is really critical. Education is terribly important, it's a key part of it. Obviously, uh, we've done a lot of work in public health on trying to see that naloxone is available throughout the state. People can get it without a prescription. The standing water that Brenda left is still in effect. Uh, but there are handicaps there. It's expensive. Right. And even folks that might want it because they've got a family member who is potentially at risk can't afford it. So that's an issue that we've got to figure out. How do we overcome some of that? Um, naloxone, for me as an emergency physician, um, is a just a short-term solution you know in fact it's not even a solution if we save a life with naloxone they go into the emergency department and they're released but there's not a linkage to care yeah. we haven't done anything other than maybe allow this to continue so there has got to be a firm way of aligning these people with mental health care once they have the overdose under control. And right now, based on all the information that I've seen, we do not have adequate numbers of providers who are able to manage those patients here in Georgia, looking at the huge numbers that are projected. So I see that, that that's a major gap we've got to figure out how to, to fill. Not only do we have to look at the immediate treatment, which in many cases is probably going to be medically assistive treatment, MAT. And that's a problem here in Georgia because of the few number of individuals that have applied for the waiver such that they can prescribe those three drugs that are used in that MAT period. That's an issue. Then there's got to be counseling with it. The answer is not to give a substitute for the opioid and do nothing else. There has got to be counseling. And again, we have such a shortage of providers that can provide that. And it's not really gonna be short term for most of these folks, it's long term. So we've got a huge spectrum that our strategy has to cover. And we're trying to engage all the different players that may have a role in helping us fill in some of these gaps or understand some of these gaps, or perhaps come back to the legislature with ideas of, okay, this is what we need for here. Well, and with that, Dr. O'Neill, you weren't here when I you know, brought up earlier that you know, one of the things, there was a study from one of the states that you know, have gone to using the PDMP uh, and required it. They are now seeing an increase in their heroin deaths. They think that people are bypassing because they're going to be checked. They are now just saying to heck with that and going straight to heroin. The other thing is I'm afraid there's going to be the same response. I mean, I asked somebody when the lobbyists today about a letter from McKesson's. You know, they're talking about going to and restricting what the doctors, you know, seven pills and uh, some of the pharmaceutical, uh, the pharmacies are going to, even though the doctor writes for 30, you know, just say seven, and I'm wondering if it's going to be, by getting that restrictive, if it's going to be where the person who's seeking them in doctor shop just goes, oh, what the heck, seven pills is not worth it, I'm, I'll just go get cheaper heroin, and if we're going to see, and I, you know, I was at the meeting with the Attorney General and spoke, and I hope that, you know, as we go forward, we're going to look at maybe some of the unintended consequences. Absolutely, and I think that the heroin issue is one that we need to start trying to figure out on the front end because you're, you're totally on target. We need to be expecting that. Uh, heroin is much cheaper, it's readily available, and obviously that's what people are going to turn to. Uh, and, I, and, you know, when I ask about, I asked earlier where the Samson money went, um, and maybe you can go with me to, to see this, but in the council that's going around that the speaker uh, appointed, and I've been going around the state, we were shown a program uh, developed by a movie guy who did the special effects for Avatar. I haven't seen the movie, but I mean, we're talking about that was one of the things that they did. It's an older gentleman for Israel, and he came up with six programs to help high school students. 
and they start in the eighth grade and the first one's on drugs and they see it in the eighth grade and then they go to the ninth grade and they get a review of this one and then they pick up another one and it's required now in all of Israel's schools and our public safety area had got enough grants to put the one about driving in a hundred schools and he's funding that and I'm wa that's why I was asking where's the money because if we looked at the one on opiate and drug ad and alcohol addiction if it was really good would we could we find the money somewhere to put it in a hundred schools in our most you know the areas we're going to have the most trouble or something if it pans out and it's done with the latest techniques and the kids uh, you know apparently like it it's part of its 3d uh, and apparently they're apparently having some really good effects with it and it's all, and they're doing it all over the country and uh, in different places so that's why I was asking something new different innovative and a way to uh, start when you're talking about it that very young age I just need to find the money uh, like the public safety people did to uh, do a grant and put it in so uh, I've asked them to show it to me you want me to let you know when I go I would love see to see it that. Um, because just the little blurb that they gave us was really uh, interesting on driving and all. So. And, you know, I think that, that pulling all these folks together like the Attorney General did and keeping the dialogue in that whole group is going to bring up a lot of ideas such as that that public health might not ever think about to include in the strategy. So I think that, that having such a... Um, multidisciplinary input into the strategy is really critical if we're going to do the best thing that we can do for Georgia. And so, I think if we identify the needs, we will find ways to find the money. The money for it. We've just got to be clear. We've got to know that the evidence th is there to support what we're asking for. Um, and then there are a lot of different ways. It's, it's not necessarily uh, state funding that has to do this. There are a lot of options that we need to consider. Representative Hawkins has a question. Yeah, I'm really impressed with your knowledge base. I, I, I'm really thankful that you're, you're our new commissioner. Yeah. Uh, we have, we've had great commissioners in the past, and it looks like we've got another one. Uh, My predecessor was better than me. <laughs> She's very good. And he I doesn't want to keep it. He wants to go back to doing what he was doing when we get a new governor. Yeah. We may have to interfere with yeah. that. I want to go back a little bit to the PM, uh, PDMP. You know, back about 2002, there was a Harold Rogers uh, funding, uh, national funding for that, the money ran out, and, and Rick Allen uh, was always struggling with that because we were trying to develop our own uh, program here in Georgia going back to 2009. But at that time, we were looking at some studies of real-time prescription uh, uh, monitoring programs. Uh, the expense of that was just way out of sight. Now, the national, the tr Trump's um, committee now that's looking at this, um, I've heard some talk about that again. Oklahoma started a real time. Is that something that, that you're hearing about? And let me say to the audience, real time is, is for prescription writers, uh, the, the providers, when they write the script and, and the patient or calls the script and the patient is at the pharmacy, the pharmacist puts in the script with, that has a code and it will show the pharmacist if that patient has gotten that drug at any pharmacy anywhere in the timetable. Also, there's some information in there that, that sort of correlates with the provider. I never write over more than 12 uh, hydrocodones. So if someone comes in with 44, that's a red flag. Where are we with that, or have you heard anything about that? We're a little bit closer, but we're not there yet. Yeah, we got it. And the legislation that brought PDNP over to public health contains right. some changes such that the pharmacist, instead of having seven days to enter the information, has to do it within 24 hours. Right. That's obviously not real time, but it's certainly closer. Again, one of the things that Brenda, coming out of private practice, which I think is, is really important for a commissioner to have had that experience, she, she felt from the very beginning that the need was real time and had been pressing that. And I think we will eventually get there, uh, not necessarily in the next year, but maybe within a couple of years. Right, good, what? good. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just, you know, after the fact, the patient's got the drug. I mean, after the fact, if he's been doctor shopping, and, and I will tell you, I still ask pharmacists if I call something in, um, 
I, I don't call in for a patient I don't know, but some patients I haven't seen in a long time, and you hear this a, a continuing s story saga that starts ringing bells in your head about this may be a problem. And what I found is that one drug chain is not talking to the other in the old system. So, you know, if they go on to Rite Aid, then they can sort of check their own, but if they went to, to one of the others, there was no correlation and no, no, you know. So this was great to hear. Thank you. Well, and did we, I'm sorry. Did we open it up enough about the communications between the doctors and the pharmacist? And, you know, we had reluctance to do that because of the fear of sharing of information and that somebody would misuse that information was what kept it from. <laughs> well, no, I've, you're I've right. been here since the beginning. I know, no, no, I fought that battle and over in the Senate it's side. And, she's, and, and the chair lady's right. That's, that was the, and we already had the information, and so did the pharmacist. But they were so afraid that it would yeah, be misused. And we, we have had one case that apparently is being prosecuted by the drugs narcotic where some nurse pulled up something and then shared it with the front office in a small community and the oh. word got out and there's a hundred thousand dollar fine with that and i think oh. that they're going after them uh, but and a loss of license but did we open it enough this time when we went back this year to where there's the, the i mean we tried to make it where the pharmacist could talk to the physician the physician could if you're an orthopedic surgeon, but you think the person has a problem, you can call the family practitioner. Do you feel like we opened it up enough? I, I do. I, I think we still have the responsibility for privacy. Right. Uh, and that balance is hard to find. But I think that you did a really good job in this last legislation. The one area that we have a great need, though, in, and we're going to be coming back to the in session this year to ask, is right now we can't share data with bordering states. That's because And we've of got huge problems on our state borders. Yep. Okay. So that's an area that we're gonna just be just come asking. back and talk about it quietly. <laughs> <laughs> See if we can maybe get put it on another to do list to do li no or something. <laughs> so anyway, but that we've that's been the one of the problems from the beginning is not wanting to be able to share that data in case it was uh, misused. That's been from the very beginning. Yes. But I think maybe there's a little less reluctance, maybe, um, to, to do that. I think, uh, at least my opinion, is that the value of being able to share that data uh, exceeds the risk that we have. On That's the other rational, end. Dr. O'Neill. You know we <laughs> always don't do things rationally in the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> well, none of us think rationally a good part of the time. Yeah, well, that's probably true. <laughs> um, so basically dealing with the opioid crisis, those are our two areas, dealing with the PDMP and creating the strategy with multiple players to help us do that. Um, I also think that in public health, we, in many of our programs, we do have funding set aside for prevention. It, and it's, it's nebulous, it's not necessarily restricted to, <clears throat> to that basic program. And I wanna see us participate with DBHDD in the prevention effort. I want us to work with DOE on the prevention effort as well. And I think uh, we've got a really good relationship with our, our fellow agencies at Two Peachtree and working together comes easy. So I think, uh, I think you'll see some progress on the prevention side, even though the funding has been paltry for that, um, I'm really committed that we're going to we're going to find a way to fund prevention. Are we going to? I mean, one of the things where I think that I was over at the CDC one time taking a tour, and there were a bunch of people coming in, and they said, "Oh, that's people from all the different states that have uh, asked for grants," and I said, "Well." is there somebody here from Georgia? Do we get grants from you? And they said, almost none. That we didn't ask for them or that the grants were so poorly written. And I know that grant writing takes, uh, it's a skill and there are people that write grants for a living. Um, and that's not what everybody or every person that works in a different area, I certainly couldn't, I mean, I, I don't know, I've never tried, but you know, I'd be a novice at it. Are we better now? This was before, I guess it was right as Dr. Fitzgerald came. I, I, have we been able to concentrate on that area to try to get more grants from the CDC? Because apparently they CDC, give away all their money. But we're looking for grants from multiple agencies. We've had very few grants in the, in the past from NIH because there's so much research involved there. But we're working with our academic partners now 
to go for NIH grants also where they can do the research and we can provide the public health side of the piece. So uh, I can't know the exact number of grants, but I think it's somewhere near 800 that we now have. It, it's okay. huge. Uh, so I, I think we are doing a better job than we've done in the past. And, and roughly 70% of our budget is from federal grants. Okay. Thank you. Third okay. uh, priority, and I'll try to make this quick because I'm right. taking too much it's of your okay. time, no, uh, is to develop a cardiac care network in Georgia. Okay. And uh, the legislature was very prescriptive and designed this very much like we have previously designed uh, the trauma network. And I'm quite comfortable with this. The study committee that met last year basically uh, laid out what they wanted to see. Uh, and with that, they said, as funding becomes available. The first year's funding was $106,000, and the only thing that allowed us to do was to hire the registrar for the system, who's in the process of developing both an in-hospital registry and an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest registry. No other state has merged those registries. And one of the things that Brenda wanted to do was to have a single registry that included the pre-hospital piece with the hospital piece. And we're very close to, to having that worked out. Um, hopefully, Next year, we will be able to begin the process of designating the level one and the level two centers. Currently in Georgia, there are 20 hospitals that are doing open heart. There are 40 hospitals that are doing PCI, percutaneous interventions. Whether or not all those facilities meet the standards, we don't mm. know until we do designations. Uh, and I want to do the designations very much like we do trauma. I, wanna, I want there to be peer review process in there as well. I, if we're going to a cardiac uh, center that's a level one, an open heart, I want to take an open heart surgeon from another center that's not competitive as part of the team that goes and looks at that one. We've done that with trauma. It's worked very well. Actually, the team tends to learn as much as they convey, and they take best practices back to their own, own institution. So I think having that peer contact is really important. I'm not in favor of a peer-only group. I think it needs to be a mix of state personnel along with uh, peers from, from other facilities. So hopefully next year we will begin that designation process. There also are stipulations in there for giving grants to these facilities based on their level. Again, that's gonna be contingent upon funding being available. But I think it's a great idea. We're in the stroke belt. We're in the cardiovascular belt. Uh, our number of cardiovascular deaths and stroke deaths is abominable. And everything we can do to stop that is, is, is really wonderful. But we also need to fix it on the front end. We need to figure out what, are we, what should we be doing to prevent this from happening in the first place. And hopefully, just like with trauma, a lot of the data that will come out of a system is going to give us pictures for what we need to do with prevention. So I'm all in favor of this. I, I'm really interested in getting your work with it. I've had great fun working with the trauma system over the years, and I think working with the cardiac system, just as we've done with the stroke system, just as we've done with the perinatal system, all of that regionalized care makes a lot of sense economically, and also from the standpoint of allowing Georgians from wherever they live in Georgia to get top-notch care as long as not only do we have the regionalized centers, but we have adequate transport between those centers so that we're getting the right patient to the right place at the right time. And that requires a lot of work with EMS to assure that that happens. Are you getting pushback from the hospitals on moving toward this, you know, level? No. Oh, They okay. are That's chomping good. at the bits, and they can't understand why we're not designating this year. And I said, we simply don't have the funding to do that yet, but we're working on it. It's amazing. Um, these hospitals are, most of them are extremely proud of the work they're doing. And they want assist. They're also very upset because for their individual specialty societies, they have to submit data on a regular basis, usually quarterly. But they can never get their data back. And they want to know how they compare with similar facilities in other parts of the state, and they can't find out that information. So what we've said is, okay, we're developing a registry that we want to be your registry. We want you to be able to go in there, get your data whenever you want it, however you want it, in whatever format we can provide it, 
And also, you can look at the aggregate data. You can't look specifically at identified data, but you can look at aggregate data to see how you stand. So that's where we go with the cardiac care. The last thing that I've added as a priority is enterprise system modernization, and that's IT modernization. Uh, yeah. We've got 18 health departments. <clears throat> they all have IT systems. None of them speak to each other. They don't speak to us. And when you want me to tell you the number of cases of mumps in Floyd County, I have to call up there to ask. I can't pull it out of a system. And we need to be able to do that. We need to see that data as quickly as you need it. So it's, you funded us beautifully for that. We've got good federal funding for it. I was a little upset about six weeks ago because it didn't look like we were gonna meet the requirements that uh, USDA had put upon us to have EBT available by 2020. And uh, I decided that we needed to reorganize things. Uh, I put three people full time on this project that are doing a fantastic job. We are gonna meet the, okay. the deadline of 2020. And uh, actually this coming year, we're working on the EHR piece in all of our districts. So making major progress and I'm really pleased with that, but I made it a priority because if we fail there, I think it will be one of the worst black eyes that public health can get. Not only because we'll have to give back federal dollars, but because of the money that you've given us and we fail to use it properly. So this is a priority. We are gonna get this done and we're gonna get it done according to the proper timeline. Thank you. Any Qu questions? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, just a comment. I, I was really interested in, in what you were talking about with the stroke and the heart. I'd, Actually, the stroke uh, bill was my legislation, and then I did, carried the heart on the House side from uh, uh, Butch Miller. I met with the uh, principals of the heart uh, folks two weeks ago. David Bain was there at that meeting, and I know that they were talking about the repository as being Emory for that information. I, I just want to tell you, I appreciate if you, everything you're doing. If I can help in any way, if, if it needs to be public health being the repository of the information and the data, that I, that's great. I mean, you know, the, we, I, when we worked on the stroke, we tried to pattern after the uh, trauma hospital. So everything would flow almost seamlessly, and so was the cardiac care bill, the, you know, the level. So anything we can do, please let us know. <clears throat> we just greatly appreciate what you've already done. Well, thank you. So, yeah. Thank you for uh, everything. And with this, we are adjourned. Thank you, Dr. O'Neill. <laughs>